Okay, I have two hats on. I teach uh, new media at the University of Malta. And I've been teaching at the University of Malta since 2013. And I approached, I arrived at university very late in my life because I'd already had a previous life working in industry and business and specializing in, in policy work. My other hat is that I, I lead something called the Commonwealth Center for Connected Learning Foundation, or we call it 3CL. And it's an EdTech foundation, which is supported by grants from anything from the government of Malta to the Commonwealth of Learning to the EU. But it operates at arm's length from government. It's almost like a, a little satellite university of its own. And most of the work we do is overseas. And in terms of this area, um, I'm very interested in this area because, I mean, way back, even in 2019, I'd already organized a conference on the post-truth society. I don't believe there is. I think there was an attempt at doing something um, with misinformation, but I think it was called a media literacy board, which was set up a couple of years ago, I think about three years ago. And I think there was somebody from university, I think I know actually the person was invited from university, from the Faculty of Education. And I never heard anything else from it. So I don't know what happened with that one. So if you're telling me, does Malta have any policy related to lies, fake news or anything like that? The only thing you're going to find is probably some initiatives coming from the journalists, associations, the press, the press kind of guys. I don't think you're going to need, and normally Malta relies on the laws of the land in terms of libel and slander and things like that when it comes to anything to be untruthful. I think you have to be careful. I think, first of all, in terms of, you know, if you're talking about social media, what social media platforms are you talking about? Because all of social media platforms have separate rules of engagement, okay? We never read the terms and conditions, social media platforms. So, in fact, one of the things we were discussing earlier this week is that in some cases, okay, let's say if I post something on my, I update my Facebook page, okay? I think even on my Instagram page, I can go in, write something, and then somebody tells me something's wrong and I can go in and edit it. You can't do that with Twitter, for instance. You can delete it, by which time somebody's taken a snapshot of it, but you can't. So, you know, you, you can't bundle social media. It, it all depends on the individual platforms that we we trust with our data, okay? So it's, it's, it's a very mixed bag of things, okay? And we only became aware of, in a way, problems with, with this because of the various Cambridge Analytica scandals, because of, you know, Donald Trump lies, all of these kind of things. Um, that's when the whole term fake news started coming to. It became part of our vernacular. Now, it's almost faded a bit ever since Trump left office, but the problem has become worse now more than ever. So if you look at anything around the world, um, then we can talk about you know, what's fake and what isn't. We, we, we're now entering a new age, I guess, with machine learning, with, you know, with, these, with chat GPT and GPT-4 and BARD and all of this kind of stuff. Academia is something like left 15 years behind at the moment. I mean, academia at the moment is struggling with, you know, still talking about exams and essays and, and, and fake stuff like that and cheating. Academia is, is going to go through one of its biggest crises ever since, I don't know what, ever since, you know, people tried to stop people entering lectures, lecture halls with their computers. You know, there were a whole regime of things. And you, so... Um, Academia is definitely not well suited to talk about these things. And at the moment, if you can see how people in academia are kind of positioning themselves, there are either people who are trying to avoid it or not talk about it, or are people saying we should ban it, which is very much the, the Victorian attitude. Now, people like me who said these are new tools, we'll work with them and use them. Um, but it is going to be, it already is very disruptive, I think. Um, but it depends on what your particular interest is, whether you're interested in truths and untruths or fake or not fake, because if you're going to go with the fake, you should now be looking at things like deep fakes. You should be looking at the fact that 
you can record my voice now and put it in the machine and make me say things which I'm not saying. You can even record my face now and put it on somebody else's body. Um, we, we are literally just, you know, it's like chipping at the tip of the iceberg right now as to what's going to happen. And what's going to happen is, is that all of this stuff is going to become mainstream and we are really not prepared as a society to deal with this new way of both problems and opportunities that we're going to face. So in a way, what we were discussing in 2019, which is when my, my book came out in 2020, I think in terms of media technology and education trying to deal with these issues, I think the problem has now has not been exacerbated. I think we, we, we're getting into a totally new era of how to navigate truths and untruths. And we're not prepared, any of us, as to what's going to happen. Okay. Look, I'm going to pull back a bit, okay? And uh, I've got my book hanging around here. I mean, I was talking to a colleague of mine this morning, who we should speak to, because he's a maths professor at in Berkeley, um, in the US. And we're probably going to do a book together about algorithms and the power of algorithms as it happens, okay? Um, my view was, is, and remains that media, technology, and education can be sources to help us solve the problem, the problem of misinformation, disinformation, or if you want to go down the Dirac Chan way, malinformation. I think he's splitting hairs a bit. Okay, or um, so they're potentially things that can get us out of the woods or things that can keep us in the woods. Now, my view was and remains that as long as this innovation is in the hands of engineers, software engineers, whose only business model is, 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 is advertising, we, we, we're not going to get out of this in a hurry. So what's happening now is what happened at the turn of the last century when social media, the social media were other when the internet bubble burst and all of these social media platforms starting to kind of evolve, come out of the woodwork, okay? We have different iterations of social media now all the way up to the TikToks of this world, okay? So if you're asking me for solutions, the only solution I subscribe to is education, but I would say that. In other words, we need to inform ourselves. But informing yourself is complicated. You can either go the EU way. The EU way, what I'm saying is the EU way has many years been talking about competencies, digital competencies. The EU has come up with digital competence frameworks for citizens, for educators, for your dog, probably, okay? The way things have been going, okay? And it's essentially what we call these composites so for 21st century skills, we try and recycle them, okay? The trouble is that a lot of us don't understand how algorithms work. They're not mainstream. A lot of the algorithms are proprietary to a handful of large companies who provide us with tools that we use for free. Now, I happen to think that there's no free lunch anywhere, okay, on the planet. Um, and that's the, bargain, that's the bargain that we've made. Okay, that we've agreed, agreed, in other words, every single time we click and say, I agree to use a platform, I, I subscribe to their terms and conditions, but none of us ever read them. I don't, I'm sure you don't, maybe you do, I don't, I know I don't. Okay, that means that our data is theirs, that everything, that's the holy bargain we've made. It's free, but it's not free, and not, we are the data. We know this is, these are result hat, we've been discussing this. Nothing's going to change with the new wave of machines, except that the machines are becoming more more powerful. And now you can either go to the dystopian way, which says, you know, it's not going to become very easy for me to get the machine, to, you know, for me to put in some code into a machine and say, hack this. And I know there are colleagues of mine already playing around with this. Or else it could be the other side, what I was hearing, you know, somebody who, whose grandfather went in for tests at a hospital, had an MRI scan, the data came back, and the guy knew he had to wait for about a week until his grandfather could see the surgeon. Instead, this guy went to chat GPT or GPT-4, which he was using, literally put in the tests and came up with a really good analysis as to what was wrong with his granddad. So that by the time his grandfather went to see the surgeon, 
he was much more informed. So remember, it's always good at this stage, if you want to solve the problem, to look at the good and look at the bad, and then place yourself somewhere in between. And that's where we are. This situation is not any different to what we always had with the social media dilemma and, and then all the other problems which came out with it and the Francis Haugers of this world, all the, all the genie which came out of the box as we started to realize what was and remains the problem. We are trusting platforms which belong to entities whose job primarily is not to educate us or look after us or even have some sort of social responsibility towards us like newspapers might claim that they have. They're there to make a buck. The problem remains this, in the same way that people have been advocating for social media platforms to be regulated as platforms, so, sorry, be regulated as media organizations, media outlets like newspapers, like, you know, like the BBC, like CNN. Nobody's never managed to do this. Imagine how we're going to do this now with machine learning. With machine learning, remember, we've gone with open AI that's in, in charge of chat GPT for saying, here it is, it's free within one week. Well, if you want the premium version, you've got to pay for it. Now GPT-4 is behind the wall, you've got to pay for it. Then there's Google coming in with Bard and saying it's going to become, we, we have, it's, you can see it, it's going to go the way it always was. It's, it's shrouded, it's cloaked, it's proprietary, and it's built by engineers who are in the employ of private sector organizations worldwide, whose job it is not to reveal what's happening. I don't know if that's the answer you wanted, but that's the way I'm seeing it. It's not dystopian. It's a very realistic view, okay? The only solution, in my view, is to educate yourself. The only entity I know that's trying to do something about this is, is the Times of Malta, and that you might have met him. I think, I think it was, you know, the University of Malta is in partnership, I think, through my faculty, with the Times of Malta and some other, I think a couple of other universities, and they, they're looking at fact checking. Now, fact checking stories. Okay, now again, this is where I meet. Okay, I always have had a problem with journalism, and my brother is the editor of the Times of Malta. <laughs> with stories, storification, news, news stories, who decides what the story is? Who decides what is news and what isn't? You're relying on human beings. That implies all sorts of dynamics, errors, things like that, okay? That's, that's the first thing that you need. But the Times are trying and they've employed somebody who I like very much to do fact-checking on news stories. That for me is like, like the tip of the iceberg. I mean, so what? I mean, it's one thing that also implies that we are still passive recipients of news, which is developed by a finite number of media organizations. In Malta, it used to be the Times, you trust the Times, you trust the, you know, remember here in a very strange place, okay, where you have the media outlets owned by the political parties, the Times and Malta today pretend that they're kind of not aligned to anybody, okay? But in a small place, hugely polarized, Truths have always been polarized. So if you're asking me about the Malta situation, the Malta situation was, is, and remains what it was, a mess, okay? Now, with the, with the emergence of social media platforms, it also meant that everybody had the potential mega, megaphone. In the old days, and I'm sure you know about all of this, you know, our gatekeepers used to be the editors of the newspapers and people like that. Now, if I wanted to complain about something, I had to write a newspaper, okay? Now I can just, hear a whisper or I, you know, the, my neighbor is going to build a wall against it. And I might, I might, you know, go on, my, go on Facebook or whatever it is and start spreading rumors and it's going to get amplified. Okay. So what recourse Maltese people have in terms of defending truths or untruths are the old laws of Malta. Every single time that the government has even may, maybe thought of coming up with something about regulating stuff online, it's been rightly, rightly um, met by uh, resistance from people saying, you're going to say, you want to do what? Who's deciding what the truth is? The politician is? Because you, okay. So we have a mess, like every single other country has a mess. In fact, I'm not even aware of any country, okay, that has managed to regulate truths and untruths. I, I, I ran a workshop for the, well, I, was, I was part of the OSCE 
network of experts looking at this information. And I was very much uh, not in line with people in that part, of, you know, with, with that kind of with the kind of thinking that you could regulate social media platforms in the same way that you regulate newspapers. In other words, find them codes of practice and things like that. I said, you're not understanding that the business model of social media platforms and new AI regimes dictates that we are data. And as long as human beings are data, it's going to be very difficult to try and regulate against people who see every single thing that you and I see, think, feel, watch is of potential use to somebody else. So Malta is no, Malt is no different to anywhere else, except it's easier then to understand how information, misinformation, disinformation spreads, because you can see it bounce along. You could actually do a survey here. I, mean, I used to do this with my students sometimes, just showing how a piece of news would a new story, because that's the easiest thing to do. No, I mean, in the old days, it used to be, I'll give you a really stupid example, okay? In the old days, it used to be a plane crashed, okay? Now it becomes the plane, well, somebody says, I think a plane crashed, but now what will the editor of a newspaper do? The editor of a newspaper will go on Facebook and try and find some nerd who goes at every day at Luca Airport to film planes, okay? okay. And sure enough, okay, the Times found somebody who had it crashed, okay? Now, who's now got the news story, okay? How was that news story amplified? So the, that piece, whatever snippet was, okay, the editor of the Times got it and plonked it on where? On there, made a news piece, then put it on their Facebook page that starts to circulate. Then you get conspiracy theories happening and everybody commenting on it. Okay, that fuels back another piece of news, then other people. Okay, so that's how the ecosystem works. So you can actually study things quite closely over here. But if you're looking for solutions and regulations, they're not effective at all at the moment. And, and that's some of the work that I'm doing right now with, with, with the 3CL, trying to figure out if young people can come up with solutions which regulators can't. I mean, if you want me just to limit myself to those two, I can. I think if you want to look at a particular Maltese situation which became international, you, you have to look at, at, at Daphne Caruana Galizia's murder and how that's been in, interpreted. You'd have to look at even how that how Daphne's blog was being, what Daphne was doing on her blog, whether there was journalism or sometimes mistakes or disinformation or misinformation sometimes, okay? I mean, her blog is still up there, you can see it. So I, I think COVID was really interesting because it forced all of us in front of a screen, which is what you and I are doing right now, and forced, all of us to rely on what the screen was giving us and also okay and um and also turn the screen into so it made politicians literally tv broadcasters now it became internet of tv so you would wait every day to find out what the hell was going on and also made us much more isolated in a way from getting news from some other sources your neighbors you couldn't even see your neighbors or gossip or things like that. But social media made up for it. Now everybody was on WhatsApp. So I don't think that changed. If anything, it made us, we, 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 we kind of went into, I'm not even sure I have a name for it. No, isolated dystopia. I don't even know what it is, you know, but I mean, I mean, it's, it's, so that's one particular crisis. Nobody was prepared for. Um, what was the other crisis that you mentioned? Ukraine? I mean, Ukraine is the other classic, I guess, but where you have, and this is going to get much worse in terms of, you know, in the era of now deep fakes. Okay. Um, and I, I think Kossain was talking about, no, somebody who was, you know, killed and yet he has a video of what this girl was doing before she was killed, was surely attacked, not attacked. I mean, we're talking about the era of CCTVs and and we believe 
camera footage, but what's real and what isn't. This is now where we're now. Everything's going to get like amplified like mad. In the old days, you needed to be a computer scientist to do deep fakes of me. Now I can go into Dal E like I done put up a picture of me and it generated somebody who doesn't look anything like me. That person doesn't exist. I can save that and say, this guy's name is, I don't know, somebody else. And here we are. That's really elemental, let alone what, what's about to happen. And, and, and so again, how do you fix that? Now, normally you say you fix that through regulation. So you need to educate the governments. Educating governments is not easy. And yes, I have that policy. I mean, I have, I've been an advisor to too many ministers I can think of and, and education ministers and people who are deemed to have power and the EU, okay? Are deemed to have power, but don't know how to wield it. And what's, the, what's power when you can, you can go and find the Googles of this world, billions of dollars, and they will prefer to pay the fine rather than do something about it because their business model is at stake. Now, that's the real issue that we have, okay? The real issue is that these so-called new platforms still have very old business models. Ironically, I was, when I was speaking to Noah John Siracusa this morning, he was a maths professor, right? He said, our job is to strip the mystique around the algorithm, show people exactly what is being collected, make it understandable, okay, in the boardroom, in the home, to parents, to educators, so that the next time somebody decides to, I don't do something stupid, like, you know, I'm going to take a, a video of my sister, and I'm going to record her, and I'm going to use this little device, and I'm going to make her say things or do things that I know she doesn't want to say or do. I think twice about it, because I don't understand the ramifications. That implies education, okay? But it also implies when I'm saying media, we understand, we have to understand how these things amplify online or whatever it is we're going to be using, but whatever headsets we're going to have. Okay. So media, education. We need to understand a bit of technology. Now, I've got quite a bit of work in Africa. I went with UNESCO in Africa. Okay. And there people are still struggling with, do I have a decent broadband or not? But everybody's got one of these things. But, and we know what these things are. Okay. So the problem is, I repeat, the problem is going to get worse. And that's what my next book will be about, I guess, with whatever time I, I have, we're going to be looking at like what the technology is really all about, what it can do, and stripping the mystique of that. But then my interest is, is the reflexive relationship between media and society. You know, how is society reacting to these things? And how are these things becoming more receptive to what society wants so that people can make a buck? I repeat, this is still a capitalist model that we're talking about here. Whether it's China and then Binance and and, and, you know, and and TikTok or Instagram, okay. Yeah, I, I, I'll be able to in a couple of weeks' time. Um, it, last November, I I organized for my sense quite a large conference in Malta called Young People and Information. It's complicated, okay. So again, I brought in anything from maths professors to fintech people to I like crashing different disciplines within each other. Maybe it's not part of the, the way we normally do things at university, but I'm, I'm a strong believer in, in, in interdisciplinarity. I, I learned from somebody who's a maths professor. I learned from a philosopher. I learned from a business guy, and then I'll make up my own mind. And I think that's the kind of education that we need. That's not the kind of education that most universities come up with. So that's why what we do at the 3CL focuses on, on that kind of stuff. But what we did then after the conference is we got some young people to actually scrape the material, to actually watch the videos of all of these people talking about stuff and come up with things that resonated with them. So what we're going to publish is what we're calling a manifesto. And the first bit is kind of, what did you learn? And that's kind of academic because of course then the academics have to get involved in making sure that the words were constructed properly, but it's literally manifesto like number one to number 80. And it's like, what do young people want to do? Like, I mean, I've, I've just got, you know, so if you don't believe me, I mean, it's it's, it's, it's here, okay? I mean, and I mean, I, I mean, and it goes from, you know, manifest, the manifesto on, okay, media freedom is the first one. Manifesto number one, we are human, we are not data, full stop. Two, we have a socio-technical existence. It's not for sale or exploitation. Three, okay, we recognize there's no such thing as free media. The price of an internet connection is not the only price we're paying. 
to speak freely, the price of harvesting personal data for the benefit of third parties is rarely quantifiable. And on it goes. There's about 50, 59 of these. Okay, still fine tuning these with whatever it is. So we're going to publish this in any format to annoy anybody. So this will be published as a little pamphlet and books, and we'll spread these around, we'll published online. These will be sent to the OSC, to the OEU, and I'm getting my students to work on projects. So we want to pollute the atmosphere, but also, so I'm getting my students, I'm telling my students, pick up three of these things, working groups, come up with podcasts. And if you agree with this or not, have we forgotten anything? That's an activist approach to education. And that's what I do. That's what I do with the university, what I do outside university. There's some people who get it, many people who won't get it. Okay, but that's the way we do things. That's the way I've been doing things. And we're not just doing this in Malta, which, so we've got a similar project in, in Sweden. I'm talking to colleagues of mine who want to do something with an NGO in the UK, and I'll go to a conference over there. That's the way it goes. Ironically, in this, with, in my area, of digital literacies, let's call it like that, okay? People tend to know each other. And you basically, what you have, the international academic community, so either people my age, we call the disappointed, okay? We're the old hippies who are now in our early 60s, who actually thought that the internet was out there to liberate us. And now have realized that it's not just that it didn't liberate us, in a way it made things worse, but at the same time, what's the worst thing which can happen to me in the morning is that I don't have an internet connection, then I'm literally, I, I can't work, right? And our job is to make sure that kids, our kids, your generation, okay, can literally tell people that there's no free bar. There, it isn't. It, it doesn't exist. Nothing is free. So you're always serving somebody. So we have to make compromises. So it, I think the thing is to try and get young people to understand. In the same way that my son, who's 20, tells me, and he's at Oxford, and tells me, I'm scared of being filmed. I can't go and have a drink, Dad. Because somebody might film me and put it up online. He's had, you know, like a 19-year-old girl at Oxford who was running for some, I, I can't remember what it was, some, some president of some student society. Some other girl found a tweet that this girl had made seven years before when she was 12 and used it against her to make sure that, okay, so that this has all become very complicated. This whole, putting these tools in the hands of the untrained, uninitiated, and I don't mean that to be elitist, I'm saying we are going to have the same problem now. We're going to have extremely powerful tools in the hands of people who might, for reasons which are all related to the worst excesses of humanity, okay, jealousy, greed, whatever it is, might put these things to bad, for bad use. Our role as educators is trying to get people to say, just think of what you're doing first. Okay. That's, that's what I think. That's all we can do right now. Now, it might well be that the governments do get in. In other words, it is not inconceivable that TikTok is banned in, in the US. So what? You'll get a US variant of TikTok. In the same way with the Ukraine war, when you've got you know, one side saying we're winning and one side saying, it, or one saying, did we bomb or we didn't bomb? And look, we, I mean, we're, we're really now, all of this, we're really in the age of deep fakes. So for me, the times of Malta or whatever, it is, getting in somebody to check a story is like, good luck. It's, not, it's, it's worse than scrape, but it's, it's an attempt, okay? It's an attempt. It's challenging, okay? Let me start with this, okay? I started this semester, you know, I'm 61. I'm teaching 19 year olds. The first thing which came out of my mouth was, so what does a 61 year old have to do with teaching 19 year olds who believe they're digital natives? As soon as they opened their eyes, their parents were taking pictures of them and put them online. I saw my first computer when I was 23 in London and it was this huge. Yeah, so what can I teach them? So the only thing I can teach them is is history repeated. So I'm telling you what's happening now with the era of AI, chat GPT, GPT-4, BARD, and whatever, all, and all of the other tools which are coming up and pay for it so that I can make sure that you don't have to do your essay, you don't have to think that the machine will think of it. I've seen it before. I'm old enough to have seen it before because 
you know, I was around when the everybody was trying to look for millions and make millions during the internet era. I was there. And I remember what happened when the bubble burst, and I remember what happened when social media happened. So this history repeated. It would be nice sometimes to look at the history of technology and see how things things get repeated, and also how some old technologies don't just disappear and they get re, you know, repurposed. We still have radio. We just call it podcast now, do we? But it's now video on demand. What's video on demand? Is it YouTube? You know, these are old things which haven't disappeared. We still got them. We don't watch TV, but we watch Netflix. But I'm doing different things now. So technology changed, but because technology changed. We're now what? More informed, more distracted, more powerful. I can afford to live in a small claustrophobic place like Malta, because most of my time I'm speaking to people like you, but they're in other parts of the world. That's how I survive. So this morning I, I spoke to somebody in Brussels. Then I spoke to Noah John Sirico, who's just been waking up with, with his kid and somewhere in the US, and you know, and, and he's got chickens outside. And then we're talking about doing a book together. I couldn't do that without the internet. Am I grateful for that? I couldn't live without that. I didn't have that in my 20s. So you guys are really lucky to have been born with that. But sometimes it's good to switch off. The biggest problem we have is the attention economy. It is impossible to get anybody's attention anymore. But they're in the class. So Hossein Darakshan, and you saw, was grumbling afterwards. He said, nobody was looking at me. I said, when was the last time you lectured? I said, this is what happens all the time. I have students with... It used to be a computer as a shield, and now I have the, you know, that's a shield. And I know they may or may not be listening. And you have to try and, as an educator, you have to pull every single trick out of the book to perform like a stand-up comedian when you're doing education. That's the business of education. It's stand-up comedy, partly. But then also sometimes, from a positive point of view, something amazing happens. When you're engaging with people real time, you can look into people's eyes. The only thing you can have is focus our attention. How can we put our attention to best use when everybody wants to grab your attention for its own private gain to make money out of you? All of us have made mistakes when we got distracted. I remember waking up in the morning on a very dark morning, close to Christmas, and he goes, it's half asleep, it was very dark, and I don't know how it happened, but I think 10 minutes later, I had bought a lamp online because it said it's a natural lamp and what the lamp, lamp was, you know, and I bought it because that, you know, so I was gained going to Instagram, something. So it made in Sweden, of course, it wasn't made in Sweden, it was made in China somewhere and I paid 40. It actually arrived as opposed to some of this. Okay, so how can I, next time I should have been a bit more careful about what I bought. No, that's a real practical issue. But the real deep issue is how can you have meaningful conversations now with people? How can you establish real relationships with people um, when you have all of this technology around. So in the same way that relationship have, relationships have changed because of Tinder and all of the other ways that people meet. And it's a good thing, I think, because people, I mean, I don't know how people could have met during COVID days when people were being told to you know, keep a distance away. But I think managing our attention is the biggest problem that we've been dealing with now for at least the last 15 years and it's going to get much worse and in the same way and i am guilty of this like anybody else so i'll be speaking to you i might even be listening to you i'm very rudely looking at my phone and thinking what's my next meeting that's the way we all are living the moment is the biggest challenge your generation is going to have because suddenly you'll wake up and you'll be my age and there's going to be new devices and you realize that your life has gone away and some of the most beautiful things about life is living the moment. Unfortunately, you realize that too late in your life. What that has to do with your project, I have no idea, but that's what I can tell your students. One of the only reasons why I sometimes feel compelled, let me go and do a lecture, because it's otherwise, it's just broadcast, okay? Now, unfortunately, at the University of Malta, we do not have students who are, and it is not their fault, they are coming out of an education system where they have been told, listen, absorb, pass your exams, say nothing, don't challenge authorities, pass your exams, and that's it. Okay. So, and then they meet somebody like me who's telling them, here's some information, here's some books, you read, flipped classroom techniques, think, work in groups, look at the group dynamics, whatever, and they get lost. And you can immediately see them, right? So some will get lost. So anybody, any educator worth his or her salt knows that when they are teaching a large group like I am, if I'm teaching 70 people, there are 10 people whose lives you will change. The other 60 people, I can't reach them at the moment because it's almost too late. 
what they will do with my their life, I hope I can help them. And I know I can help those 10 people. That's the only reason why I wake up at six o'clock in the morning on a Monday to come to university, because there's other things I can do with my life. And I'm sure you will find that there are other good educators like that at the University of Malta doing the same. There are some brilliant people at the University of Malta, but a lot of them are hidden away and they tend to be the less vociferous ones or the ones who would travel a lot to get away from it. Okay, those are the ones you need to reach out for.